stories. Now the first story is about two groups of boys. Two groups of boys that were sent camping at the same site. Both groups were camping at the same site, but they didn't know that the other group existed. In fact, they lived separately for quite some time. They pitched their own facilities, built their own tents, made their own fires without being aware of each other's presence. At some point, however, they started hearing voices. They saw cops left behind and they realized that they're just, they're not alone. Immediately after they met, strong territorial reactions took place. Immediately they divided, us versus them. Now the camp staff organized some competitions. They played baseball games, they played tugs of war. Both teams did very well. However, soon after they started competing, their sportsmanship just went to just went away. So they started calling each other bad names. They started fighting. <coughs> they started flag breaking. <laughs> now, seeing that things are getting really bad, the camp facilitators said, okay, that's enough. Let's bring the two groups together. Let's all hug and kiss and forget all, all bad things that happen. So they tried to put the kids together in the same canteen. Let's watch movies together. Let's share a lunch. Well, their attempts totally failed. The two groups stayed absolutely separated, they cheered each other, and they just started food fights. Now, I'm going to tell you another story. Again, it's about two groups. Unlike the first story, these two groups were not equal in size. One of them was larger, the other one was small. Just like in the two st first story, the two groups lived separately. Well, the smaller group, however, was hurt by this segregation. As the competition started, neither of the groups did very well. The smaller group went further in spatial segregation. <coughs> Just like in the first story, when competition started, the name calling began. Now, seeing that things were getting pretty bad, there were some attempts made to bring the two groups together to get them to get to know each other better through intercultural events, through common activities. Just like in the first story, these attempts failed. The groups went into further isolation and they call each other names and pick fights when promote, provoked by their leaders. The first group, however, started to get a competitive advantage. This first group had a youthful population. It was the result of having more kids, but also it was the result of their shorter lifespan. You may realize now the two groups that I'm talking about. You've probably guessed already the protagonist of the second story. The second story is the reality of our social disintegration here in Bulgaria. It's the reality of us versus them, majority versus one, minority. The first story, some of you who have taken psychology courses, have also recognized. This was a social experiment conducted in 1954 by two social psychologists, Mustafer and Carolyn Sheriff. Now, I'll stop my storytelling right here at this point because I want to make them a note that how this story develops of two groups of boys in the camp. It has very important messages to dealing with the reality of social disintegration in my home, if not host country. Now back to the story time. Seeing that these groups are not getting together, the camp staff decided to devise some very urgent, urgent problems to be solved. For instance, one morning, our little boys wake up to find out that their water supply is totally dead, no water in the whole camp. They look around and they see, well, there is a hole in the pipe. The water supply is leaking. Now, the boys have to get together, all of them, to inspect a 50-kilometer-long pipeline to figure out where's the hole, how to fix it. They had another problem. They had a broken truck. They had to join forces to face up to a challenge. Now, after solving these problems successfully, the boys were reconciled. They forgot about the name calling, forgot about the prejudice. They even went back on the same bus and started singing songs together. There we go, the bus. <laughs> now, you'll see that just like in our experiment story, 
in a real life story, are two groups of face up to a problem of sparse resources. We're here in Bulgaria, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my country, your country. Our country is one of the oldest in Europe, oldest in the old continent. And what I mean to say is not to write about its cultural heritage. I mean to alarm about an aging population, a population that's aging at the fastest rate in Europe, and the fifth fastest aging population in the world. You may know that here in Bulgaria we have 2.2 million of retired people, pensioners. Now the problem here is that there are more people that retire that actually enter the workforce. Just in 2011, there are four people, four people working to support um, one pensioner. Now in 2050, the ratio will be completely different. There will be less than two people working to support a person that goes into retirement. This is a trend, and where this trend is leading is that in 2050, and this is just in 38 years, hopefully we'll all be still around, just in 38 years, more than 30% of our population of Bulgarians will be aged over 60. Why am I saying this? Because this is a threshold that, according to demographic experts, is going to threaten all of our social systems with degradation. What does this mean? Simply, it means that there will not be enough working people to pay our taxes, to pay for our public education, to pay for our pensions, to pay for our health care, to pay the taxes for building roads. <coughs> well, you say, this is a problem, but it's not a problem for the two groups. One of them is aging, the other one is not. No, it's a problem for the two groups, because the impact of our social and economic system is going to affect <coughs> everybody, regardless of our ethnicity. In fact, as we've seen in many social and economic crises here in Bulgaria in 97 and 2008, when things get bad, when there's an economic crisis, the vulnerable people, the disadvantaged, they suffer the most. In fact, Roma, the minority, 40% of the Roma people are aged 19 and below. Among the majority, ethnic Bulgarians, there are 15% in this same age group. 15% age permit. Now what this means is that the minority group enters the labor market at rates that are twice faster than the majority population. What this means is that every person, young person entering the labor market, one in five is trying to be of common origin. One in five people. However, many of these normal people will not actually make it to the labor market. They won't find a job. They'll just add up to an increasing unemployment among the minority population. Those that will find a job will actually earn a third less than the rest. Anybody who's of Roma origin is going to make just two-thirds of what an ethnic Bulgarian will make. A World Bank recently did a study that revealed that only two-thirds of the wage difference can, it, can be explained by qualifications, lack of education, or even locality. The other one-third of this wage difference is just the pure result of discrimination. There's so many surveys that have been done that reveal that these people Roma, the minority, experience this discrimination even when they look for, for a job. What does this mean? Now, economists in modern economy, thankfully, they've done the math and they've estimated how much do we lose from the difference in wages? How much do we lose from not letting people into the labor market? The cost is 260 million euros in foregone revenues each year. 260 million. And this is not just the economic cost, which is much greater. This is just the money that gets lost from not having the taxation. 260 million. What does 260 million mean in a country like Bulgaria? In a country that's one of the poorest in Europe, in countries with one of the lowest GDPs. 260 million is 10% of the amount that the government spends on public education. It's 10% of the health insurance system. It's 
3.5 times the amount that the government allocates to emergency health care that it allocates to make sure that the ambulance that you make them is going to come on time. So, what do we need to do? What needs to be done? As any problem solving, we first need to start by defining the problem. Political leaders, public opinion makers, media, they need to talk seriously and more responsibly about the demographic trends that are going to affect the way we here will grow and the way our kids will live. The problem is not that one small group that's being a minority is trying to become a majority through a justification, whatever that means. The problem is that we will not have enough resource. We will not have enough resource, enough working people to sustain a social system that's going to collapse under its weight. We will not have enough resource, and yet one fifth of the workforce will be rotting away in the ghetto. We need to determine the goal. Now, fixing the broken pipeline, getting the water back into the system, would mean integration of the wrong through strategies for inclusion, <coughs> labor market access, better education, better housing, better health care, better access to health. You've heard this before, and I've heard it. It's a decade of wrong inclusion. It's been around for eight years. We know what to do. We know even what works and what doesn't work. The problem, the different thing that we need to do is to define this strategy as beneficial to both sides, to determine that we're interrelated and whether if we don't use our potential, we're not going to make it. Finally, it takes many people to figure out where's the feature in the pipeline and how to fix it. It's little steps. Little steps of little people like, like us. As parents, we need to refrain from withdrawing a child from an ethnically mixed classroom. Because once it becomes ethnically mixed, it becomes segregated and then collapses the quality of education. As employers, we should just give people the equal chance that they deserve, regardless of their ethnic origins. As citizens, we have to hold governments accountable. Just like we hold them accountable for anything else, we have to hold them accountable for strategies that have benefits for all. Now, you might say, well, this is kind of impossible, mission impossible. You've talked about some social experiment, but the reality is different. No, mission is possible. This first experiment, it was fundamental in laying out conflict resolution theory, in laying out initiatives to um, overcome prejudice, overcome hostilities between two groups. But we can look for many examples in real life that are both staged and unstaged to see that one's face to a common challenge that two groups can reunite to find a solution. Everywhere in the world, people have used sports events of different ethnicities, racial groups, to show that two groups can work together to achieve a common challenge. We've done this in Bulgaria. We've, we've done this with the UNDP to get normal kids with non-normal kids to get them to get, get to know each other better in sports events and through having a common goal achieve cooperation. I was recently doing some field research among policemen. We went in different uh, neighborhoods, and I was very surprised to find that those policemen working in the ghetto were actually much less likely to have discriminatory attitudes than the rest working here among the majority. Why? Because every single day they were facing a common challenge with these communities. They had to figure out who did the theft, who was responsible for the fight. It's facing up to these common challenges that made these groups realize each other's strength, realize that they're interdependent to fight crime, and finally, work in cooperation. Now I've told you two stories. I'm very tempted to tell you a third. It's about a town, it's about a town of the seaside, it's a small town. What's interesting about it is that this town has a Roman neighborhood, which is not a Roman ghetto. It has a mayor who has realized the potential and the challenge of social integration. It's about a mayor who has fixed the pipeline, both in the Roma neighborhood and in the social system. It's about a town that has made the initial investment. It's about a town that has made two kindergartens in the Roma neighborhood. It's fixed Roma school. It's 
about a town that will show you this next generation of Roma youth educated in this kindergartens. They have the potential and they will bear the weight of our aging population.